Hello, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to be with you today. Um, had a little trouble here. Technical trouble. Facebook keeps changing things. Um, yeah, nice to be with you. I'm in California. About 60 degrees here. Blue sky. And I'm here to talk about the Zimbarangro lineage of Chud, and uh, particularly the Parchamma Chud that I will be teaching uh, April 8th to 11th. It'll be from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Mountain Time. So we're starting it early so we can have uh, a chance to include Europeans. Uh, makes the time better for them. So before I start today, I'd like to raise bodhicitta to generate the intention to spend this little bit of time together for the benefit of all beings. May all beings be benefited. Thank you. So before I start, I also want to uh, speak about two other programs I'll be doing this spring after this. So first is this uh, Parchama Chut, which I'm going to talk about now, and that's the 8th to the 11th of April. And then I'm doing um, on... Um, Let's see, April 23rd to 25th, I'm doing Machik's last instructions. That were the last teachings that Machik gave, and they're really amazing nature of mind teachings. Very powerful. And then um, on the 8th of May, I'll be doing the Yabyum Mandala, just a three hour transmission of that practice of the Yabyum Mandala, of the masculine and feminine in union and the five families. So I think that'll be also really wonderful. We all have those aspects within ourselves and we also, some of us are in partnerships with those energies at play. So I'll talk about that uh, then and give the transmission for that practice. So today I want to talk about Chut in general a little bit and um, just welcoming everybody who's checking in. Um, see some people from Europe, Sweden, <laughs> and uh, Germany. Good. Well, we're, we're making this accessible for the Europeans, so it's nice to see some Europeans here today. So, uh, in general, uh, the word means to sever. It's a practice that I have been very drawn to in this life and started practicing in 1973. First Chu practice I learned was called the Naro Sangchu, which is a Chu in the lineage of Naropa, who was the teacher of um, Marpa and the really the source of the Kagyu lineage. Uh, his teacher was Tilopa. And so I actually have read some histories of Chud and they say that this lineage no longer exists, but I am here to tell you it does because I received it and practiced it from Ad Abu Rinpoche, who was the great, um, not the great, the grandson of Shakya Sri, who was a great Tibetan yogi who taught both Mahamudra and Dzogchen. He had his Mahamudra students on one side of the valley and his Dzogchen students on the other side of the valley. And he had 14 kids and lived in a cave. <laughs> so, yeah, Chakishri. So that was the first chud that I practiced. Um, then I learned the Chujil Namke Norbu which I practiced and taught a lot. And that's really what I'm most known for teaching. 
And then more recently, I learned this particular chair practice. Why? Because we began to practice the cycle of Zimbarangdral at Taramandala. Zimbarangdral is the lineage of this chair that I'll be teaching uh, next week. And Zimba means to, to cling or to fixate. And Rang means innate or inherent or self. And then Drill is liberate. So it's the inherent uh, liberation or the innate liberation or the self-liberation of clinging or fixation. That's the whole cycle. Now this particular cycle came to a very, good to say, kind of outrageous uh, Tertun treasure discoverer named Dokense Yeshi Dorje, also known as Jalu Dorje. And he uh, lived in Kam, in the area of Do, which is actually uh, the area of current day Kangding, so the very eastern part of Tibet. And uh, he was a mind emanation of Jigme Lingpa. So Jigme Lingpa passed away in 1798, and Dokensi was born in 1800, and then lived uh, to be 62. So he was quite extraordinary, and he had a very extraordinary relationship with his sister, who was born a couple of years after him and was just with him his whole life. She was the Dharma holder of this lineage. And so the whole lineage of Zimbarandral is from Machi Klaptran and Dampasanje. So it's a Chud lineage, and yet it's Terma. So he had direct visions of Machi Klaptran and Padampasanje. Uh, and, and then through that connection, uh, downloaded, and I think download is actually a good word, uh, downloaded the Zimbarangdo cycle, which we practice at Tara Mandala. And we've led people in three-year retreat there. And it's, it's an amazing cycle. So we have done the Drupchen of this for many years. And... Uh, We've had the 10-year program of Gateway with Zimbarangdral, and we still have two groups going through that. So this is a very beautiful chip practice. Our lineage comes through Kembo Tuku, uh, Kembo or Jen uh, Wangchu, I think he is kind of a Tuku, um, and uh, more directly through Tuku Sana Krimpache. Uh, it was Kembo who taught us the chip, but the lineage is from Tukusana Grimpache, who was a student of Dingo Kensi Grimpache for 14 years by his side, his attendant. And he received Zimbarangdro three times from uh, Kensi Grimpache. And so we received it from him and then practice this chit. We, we practice it at, at Taramandala, and uh, it has five different melodies. The chit practice is always sung, and it's, it's done with the, the drum. I'll show you the chit drum. This is my drum. Been around. <laughs> so um, this is a chit drum. It has a tail. It's a, the hair of a dead person and the hair of a dakini on it. And then um, various other things from sacred places, including uh, tiger skin, um, which is required for it. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a slow beat with this drum. And then you use also the, the bell. I'll just turn this down a little bit. Um, it's a rhythmic uh, practice. 
And uh, this is a shamanic drum. The chip practice is shamanic, and we undergo our own death during the practice and then offer our body to various different kinds of guests. Uh, it's known as a healing practice, um, also as a an exorcism practice, a practice to uh, remove uh, spirits, say, from certain places. And those who practice should uh, do a pilgrimage called the Nyensa pilgrimage, or the difficult places pilgrimage, where they go to charnel grounds, uh, scary places, uncomfortable places, uh, 108 of them, and uh, practice. And so part of the practice of Chud is to actually encounter your own fear. And then to so be in a scary place, encountering your fear of losing your life, of losing your body, and then offer your body at that time. And so I did this pilgrimage actually in 2012, India and, and in Sikkim. And uh, it was very powerful doing this in scary places and and actually having the fear come up and then practicing anyway. So when we do our retreat together, I'll tell some stories about that. Um, I had some real fear and some real scary things happen, which was actually very important in terms of my understanding of the practice of how when you're actually in the fear and you make the offering anyway, how liberating that is in terms of our fear of death. So before you do Nyansa pilgrimage or before you use this for healing or whatever, you have to learn it. And so during this retreat, I'll be teaching it. And then Anna Reithel, who uh, has been my student for a long time, uh, and and traveled with me for many years and is an amazing singer, uh, she will be teaching the melodies and the practice. And we're going to have quite a bit of practice time during the retreat. So uh, you will actually learn this. If you don't have a bell and a drum and a fiddling, which is the other instrument you need, it's this, uh, it's a thigh bone trumpet, human thigh bone, um, and that's used in the practice. If you don't have that, then uh, you can still learn it, and uh, that's how the young monks in monasteries learn. They have a phantom bell and drum, and uh, it's actually a good way to learn, it, even if you don't have the instruments. Uh, because the instruments are challenging, you know, it's a whole thing in itself besides these melodies and everything. So, um, just the phantom is fine. Uh, we are going to put a link into our store, Tara Mandala. You still have time, I think, to get this before the retreat. If you contact them today, uh, you can get your drum and your bell. So, that's kind of a little bit about the practice. Uh, maybe I'll just see if there's any questions. Uh, Scotland, nice. Yes, it also can affect the weather. Somebody asked that. Um, it's uh, there was a um, a llama, a yogi named Yeshe Dorje, who was known as the Dalai Lama's rainmaker. Um, and uh, he changed the weather with Chu practice. I, I actually practiced Chu with him before um, he passed away. Oh, from Findhorn. Someone from Findhorn, Scotland. That's a really interesting community that I was in in 1969 before I went to India. Still have a good friend there named Craig Gibson. Um, who went with me uh, to India and Nepal in 1969 and then went back and lived at Findhorn and has basically been there ever since. Um, so let's see, I'll just see if there's any questions. Is this chud different from the other chud offered at Taramandala? Yes, it is different. Uh, 
altar is the same in the sense that you undergo the body offering. There's that shamanic kind of shift that takes place of leaving your body and then making your body into food. However, the melodies are completely different. The lineage is different. The, um, the way the feasts are done is different. So it's significantly different and it's a bit longer. Um, the Anamki Norvacha is shorter. Uh, this is still not terribly long. It's probably a half hour to do the practice. Um, and let's see, what does the Kangling represent? Uh, the Kangling is a way of calling the various kinds of guests that you invite to the feast. And uh, it has a certain way that you play it. Um, the reason why you use a, a actual human thigh bone is because this is done in charnel grounds where there were corpses. And so traditionally in tantric uh, practice, the uh, human bones that were found in these cemeteries and charnel grounds were, were turned into different things. Like there's some really amazing uh, jewelry, like um, aprons and chest plates and so on that are carved from human bone that are used for certain dances. Um, the skull cup, of course, is a classic thing that's used on shrines uh, as, a, as a container of uh, the transformation Amrita, depending on the practice, there's different things in the skull cup. Uh, traditionally, yogis actually would eat out of, out of the skull cup. Uh, the purpose of using these bones is also as a reminder that this is going to be us <laughs> before long. Mine is hundreds of years old. Um, I received it from Adzum Pelo Rinpoche when he was here. Um, it's, it's an amazing one. I don't really know how old it is, but I know that it's, it's very old. I had it dated. Um, so uh, it's a reminder of impermanence. And uh, so it actually is a sound. It makes a sound. It's a trumpet. And um, so the purpose, main purpose is calling the different kinds of guests and it calls them in different ways. It's in evocative. Uh, they say you shouldn't use the Kongling until you really know the trip practice because they actually do come and would have they come and you're not capable of feeding them, uh, then it's better not to call them. So usually people learn it and then get their Kongling after a while can also get it and just have that as a blessing and then gradually start using it. Okay, let's see, I'm looking at these questions. Um, does the teaching include the white offering, multicolored red and black? This chud is the white and the red offering. Fit those two feasts are in this chud practice. Um, what does it kindly I, uh, I answered that how do I know if trip practice is for me or not <laughs> well I can just tell you my experience as soon as I saw the drum I actually uh, uh, saw it in a store in Amsterdam in uh, 1969 before I left for India that second time um, you know one of those stores that just has everything in it and lots of things from Asia and kind of a dark store and it had this drum in it and I was so attracted to this drum I kept going back to visit it I didn't have any money at the time so I couldn't buy it um, but then actually I did uh, end up buying that drum so that's an indication if you hear about should you see the instruments or something like that and you feel a longing uh, an attraction feeling like I want to know that I want to know it I had that very strongly for obvious reasons but um, many people have a connection with should uh, so that's one reason to learn it if you feel the connection to it 
And then another one is that it's a very good practice for overcoming our various demons. It's it's the base of my practice of feeding your demons comes from the chut practice. And so it's a way to encounter your own maras, your own demons. And it's also a healing practice. So it has a lot of different uses and it's shamanic, which I think is interesting, this combination of ancient Tibetan shamanism, pre-Buddhist, and Buddhism, based in, in Prajnaparamita, Mahayana uh, teachings. So Chud is a combination of those things. They also say that Chud is the totality of all practices, that all practices are within the Chud. Uh, for example, the uh, poa is in the Chud practice. There's uh, aspects of, of lots of different kinds of practice within it. And so it's called the totality of all practices. It's considered to be a bhoktun practice, which means a um, enhancement practice. So you, you already have other practices, but then you want something you like to push a little further to enhance, to push you uh, to another level. And Chud is, is that practice. Um, started learning Chud but get pain in my upper right hand. Do you have any suggestions? Um, oh, arm, not hand. Um, probably um, too much tension. So what I would suggest is you... Um, if you can see me well, I'm going to turn the camera down for a minute. So um, my, I have my elbow against my body so that I'm actually not, I, I'm not having my arm out, kind of floating. It's in, and that way it's much less tiring for your arm. And then just to relax, I think at first when we learned we're kind of like gripping our, our drum for dear life. <laughs> but uh, you try to relax and you, you will relax after a while. I had the same problem when I started learning. My arm would get so tired. Um, and then my teacher showed me that uh, thing about holding it against your body and that was really helpful. Let's see. Can we develop a relationship with these unseen beings through Chud? Yes, we can. Uh, we can develop that relationship. It's also really interesting to do it in different places. For example, I remember uh, when I first started teaching in Germany, I went to a place uh, called Kamalashila in, in Germany. It's a Karyu center there of uh, His Holiness Karmapa. And I was just doing Chud the first night of the retreat, and suddenly all these beings appeared, and I realized this had been the site of a battle in uh, World War II. And there were a lot of spirits still sort of lurking around who hadn't been fed, who, who uh, were um, like ghosts. And so I did a lot of practice with them there. But every time I go somewhere, I have the experience of, you know, not feeling anything particular. Um, and then I do the practice and then I'll see things and, and get in touch with that place in a whole different way. Uh, and there's a practice of compassion, so you're you're connecting with those beings and then um, feeding them with with love and compassion. There's also something called Chut Eyes. Uh, you can read about it um, in a book called Blazing Splendor. That's a biography of uh, Toku Urjin. Um, and he talks about it in connection with his father. And it's something that I experienced, but I never I didn't know it had a name until I read that book, and I was like, oh, that's what that is. And it's called Chud Eyes, and what happens is 
while you're doing should, you can actually see things. Like I can see what's going on with somebody physically who's ill. Uh, when I'm in the chud, I can't n normally, but when I'm in the chud, I can uh, I scan their body and I can see illnesses and what they come from. And so that's an interesting thing. Uh, I don't think everybody has that, and it, it doesn't come immediately, but uh, with the long-term practice, uh, that can happen, it should eyes. So it's definitely possible to make contact with beings and then to feed them with love and compassion. Um, do you need to be in a special place to do the practice? No, any place is fine. Uh, if you're in a place where uh, people would get upset with the sound of the drum, uh, you can practice it without the drum, like at home, people are in apartments or whatever. Although usually if you do something before it's late at night, um, you can make noise. I mean, you can play music in your apartment. So um, I guess it depends how thin the walls are, and your neighbors and so on. But uh, there's no special place uh, for to practice, although Traditionally, it was done in cemeteries and scary places. But first, you have to learn it, um, and then you sort of take it on the road. So this will be a learning retreat. How do you use Chub with feeding your demons? Well, the way I use it is with feeding your demons, I'll I'll get the image of a of a demon. You know, you see what it looks like, and then when I do the traditional trip practice, I invite that demon as one of the guests in the, in the feasts. So you can work with it that way. Is there a dichotomy between Kilaya Purva practices and should? Yes, there is. <laughs> it's, uh, that's why it's really considered to be a very unique practice because there's a lot of practices where we are defeating negativity in one way or another, or protecting ourselves, uh, doing, setting up shields or uh, protecting, protections of different kinds, um, or, you know, longevity practices. But the Chu is really different in that you're actually told to take off your protection amulets if you have them, and uh, you're, you're offering your body uh, so you're, you're going against that tendency to protect yourself um, or to destroy enemies, uh, which is part of other practices. And you go against that and you break through that fear uh, that you're working with in those practices and, and do the opposite, offer. And this is based in the teachings of Mahayana um, the offering of the body uh, goes back to the Mahayana tradition and it doesn't mean that uh, like a true practitioner wouldn't do Vajra Kilaya. it's just a different practice it's a different kind of practice and so some practices are for protection or, or um, destroying obstacles and that kind of thing and Chud is really a practice of severing the ego and and feeding, not fighting. That's the way I talk about it. And it's an interesting metaphor of feeding, not fighting. And it, it, it's interesting that it comes from a woman, a woman teacher, Machi Laptram is the source of, of Chut practice. And it's uh, feeding, not fighting. It's nurturing rather than destroying, which is a feminine, uh, characteristic, you know, the mother would always try to get the kids to um, come eat something, <laughs> stop fighting. Uh, there's that nurturing quality of the feminine that's present in the true practice. Not that men are not nurturing, I don't mean that, but uh, if we are to generalize about those energies, the feminine is uh, 
nurturing, you know, literally uh, breastfeeding in the early time of our lives, if we're lucky to get breastfed. Um, so here's somebody asking the connection with Dzogchen. And, um, and should practice. Um, as I said, Chut is a Bogdan practice, it's an enhancement practice. And uh, you're working with the understanding of the nature of mind. Uh, with Dzogchen practice, is based on effortlessness, on uh, the inherent liberation of phenomena on the vast open emptiness and its lucid awareness that permeates everything, the ground of being. So what the chair practice does is sort of, let's say you, you're a Dzogchen practitioner, you're going along, relaxing, effort, effortless ing, and then uh, you want to push a little further uh, to encounter something. In a way, it's a, to test yourself. So the, uh, the Nyansa pilgrimage, like going to these difficult places, is like you test, like, okay, how, how free of fear am I really? Um, and actually you should feel fear uh, with a true practice because that very energy that's, that's uh, stuck in the fear becomes a liberation energy, becomes the, that degree of, of the fear or the clinging when it's liberating, pushes and enhances our our wisdom, and so it's it's a it's a good practice uh, combination to do those two together. Uh, can I say something more about it as a healing practice? Yes, it's uh, it's done as a healing practice. For one thing, the uh, merit of uh, offering the body of the ill person uh, benefits them uh, because their body is offered as well as yours. Um, and then also, because of the power of the lineage, the capability of the practitioner of Chuk, um illnesses can be drawn out of the body and fed. And so if you think about it, let's say you have cancer that cancer is feeding on your body. It's eating it, literally. And so if then that cancer is invited out of the body and fed at another location, then that could create healing. I'm not saying that should heals cancer. It would really depend on the practitioner and so on, so many circumstances would need to come together. But, possible. Um, it, is, it is known uh, to be a healing practice for that reason because the illnesses can be brought out and then fed. Another way that the cho was used uh, traditionally in Tibet was to work with epidemics. So think COVID. Um, I'll use the example of an uh, animal epidemic. Uh, for example, in the life of Ayukandro, whose story is in my first book, Women of Wisdom, she talks about an illness that was going through the herd animals in Tibet, and she was asked to do the trip practice for that. And so then what you do is you find, let's say it's hoof and mouth disease, then uh, in the practice you find the entity of that disease and you feed it. You draw it away from the animals and you feed it uh, from the skull cup during the time of uh, the offering of the body and you feed it whatever it, it wants and needs. And so that pulls it out of those beings and then um, that acts as a healing. Uh, it could be done for cholera, it was done for cholera in, in Tibet and it's said that the Cho practitioners didn't get the infectious diseases 
because they were working with the chip practice so intensely. And so they were able to go into areas where there were epidemics and uh, work with the corpses of the deceased and so on. I wouldn't recommend you take this retreat and then uh, start working with COVID um, in infected areas, but um, it was used uh, traditionally and is still used that way. So let's see. When you're pregnant, do you offer your body with your baby's body? Um, is it safe to do while you're pregnant? Yes, I think it is because it's overcoming attachment and uh, letting go. It's certainly not going to harm uh, you or your baby to do it. I did a, a lot of it actually when I was pregnant with my first child. Um, your understanding emptiness and offering on that basis. So, um, yeah, don't worry. Probably good for you and for the baby because it accumulates merit also. <laughs> Is it okay to do it if you have not learned the other chud? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine to do um, when... Uh, when you haven't learned another practice, you can start with this one. Um, it doesn't matter which should you start with. It's um, it's all should. <laughs> that one is a little shorter, um, but you know they both involve the drum and the bell and and so on. So this is a great should to start with. It's so beautiful too. The melodies are really beautiful and the way Anna sings them like when Kembo heard Anna sing it we we, we uh, performed it at the time when His Holiness Karmapa um, offered me the Machiklaptran empowerment should empowerment in 2012 we practiced it with our group who had been on pilgrimage together and Anna led it and um, at the end Kembo said Anna that was perfect <laughs> and Kembo is really particular so she really knows the melodies, and um, they're very beautiful. I think that's that all the questions. Did I get everything? Oh, here's something. What should advise people who are so caught up in the energy of fear in a relationship with a team from all over the world. I mentally recite the mantra Om Mani Padme Hum so that her energy spreads around. Uh, this sounds like a non-English speaker who's asking this question so I need to try to figure out exactly what the question is. Um, it sounds like how to work with fear basically um well the chair practice is good to work with fear that's the whole point of it um and if you're otherwise uh don't know the chair practice and you're working with fear uh mani padme hum has so many blessings connected to it that's a wonderful mantra to do to visualize yourself as avalokiteshvara um, and you can find this four-armed Avalokiteshvara or Chenrezi. Uh, maybe, um, Lori, you could write that in the chat, those words, um, Avalokiteshvara or Chenrezi. You can find images of the four-armed uh, Chenrezi online, and you see yourself as him, and you're sending out love and compassion. So uh, compassion overcomes fear oddly enough. Uh, it's hard to feel afraid when we're feeling loving kindness. So either Avalokiteshvara, uh, Chenrezi, Tibetan, Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit, or Tara, Om Tare Tutare Ture Swaha, 
Om Tare Tutare Ture Swaha. Om Tare Tutare Ture Swaha. By that mantra, visualizing yourself as, as Tara and sending loving kindness out to all beings is also really helpful. <laughs> You're welcome, Monica. Um, yeah, so this is the practice of, of Dokense or Shidorje from uh, the cycle of Zimbarandral. I'll talk more about that lineage uh, when we actually do the retreat. And um, there'll be uh, several hours, two, two to three hours of practice a day, and then I'll be teaching two hours a day. So uh, it's a substantial retreat. Uh, Anna will be doing the drumming, and then there'll be practice sessions. And then you can also get the recording and the um, video of the practice afterwards so you can continue to practice since you're not going to learn it in three days <laughs> in a way that you can really take it forward without that. Um, we also have online Parchama Chip practice weekly uh, led by Lopen Beth. And you'll be able to participate in that after the retreat. And we're probably going to start another Zoom uh, trip practice, so you'll be able to, to continue. It's important uh, when you learn a practice to have some way to continue. I mean, it is a blessing to learn the practice, but it's good to have a way to continue it. If you are a terrible singer, <laughs> is the practice still successful? <laughs> yes, it is. It's, it's about motivation. It's about your visualization. It's not about the melodies. I mean, the melodies are blessed and they're blessings. Um, and you can always do it with the recording uh, to help you if you have trouble remembering melodies. But uh, don't worry. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Any preparations one should engage in before the teachings? Uh, to uh, read what you can about the church, to get the instruments, uh, if uh, if that's possible. In in Europe, I believe you can order them from Kamala Shila, um, and uh, that's uh, maybe Laura. You can put uh, write Kamala Shila on online. Um, because you won't have time to get it from Taramandala if you're that far away, um, unless we DHL it to you. We do have, Taramandala, I think, has the highest quality chud drums in the world. Uh, we have them prepared in a very traditional way. Uh, there's mantras written inside under the skins. The skins are prepared in a traditional way, and we use the traditional wood that is used in the drums. And uh, so our drums are really amazing, as are our bells. Um, and we have a new store uh, that um, we just launched. So uh, the actual Tarmondo store is a lot easier to work with and uh, faster and so on than it used to be. So, um, should link with Prajnaparamita and the core can't be found. Can be found, yeah. Yes. Um, yes, should is linked with Prajnaparamita due to the connection with Padampasanje, who brought it, uh, the roots of Chud. They say uh, the actual practice of Chud came from Tibet. And this was why the Indian pundits came to sort of debunk Machi Glaptran and ended up uh, developing devotion for her. But she said, my practice comes from Tibet. This is a dharma from Tibet. So the actual process of the um, feeding and the drum and so on comes from Tibet, but the roots of the philosophical aspect of Chut, 
are from India, from Aryadeva the Brahmin, who's not the same Aryadeva who was the um, follower uh, or followed historically um, Nagarjuna and founded the uh, Yogacara philosophy of Mahayana. This is called, uh, this person's called Aryadeva the Brahmin and lived much later. And uh, he was the uncle of Padampasanjaya. His name was Aryadeva the Brahmin. And he taught this teaching, this lineage that is called uh, uh, Shije. And um, that means the pacification of suffering. And it's based in Prajnaparamita. Um, not only the Heart Sutra, the Heart Sutra is an ab abbreviated form of the Prajnaparamita Sutra, uh, and the best known of, of, of the Prajnaparamita Sutras is the 8,000 line Prajnaparamita Sutra that developed uh, between around 100 uh, years before Christ and 100 years after Christ. Prajnaparamita Sutra is the philosophical base of. Um, 